Basic Brewing Radio is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, who invites you to celebrate Mead Month this August. For a limited time, the American Homebrewers Association is offering a free copy of Ken Schramm's book, The Complete Mead Maker, to joining and renewing members. You still have time. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash mead for details. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash mead. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 26th, 2021. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Dr. Keith Villa, founder of Blue Moon and Saria Brewing, returns to talk about his book, Brewing with Cannabis. We delve a bit more into the details of making non-alcoholic beer and how to add cannabis to our homebrew. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, we encourage that. Check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who has helped out in that way. If you help out, you'll you'll be rewarded. If you go to base, uh, uh, patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. This Friday, I'm going to send out a subscriber-only bonus video to all financial supporters. It's the one I talked about last week showing how I make chicken stock out of leftover chicken parts and odds and ends of veggies that would have just been thrown into the compost. I hope that you enjoy that kind of stuff, that it inspires you to sort of get back into the basics of cooking in the kitchen. I, I used my homemade stock a couple of days ago to make some split pea soup, which was not, you know, split pea soup is not very pretty, but it's way delicious. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason they used it in that one scene in The Exorcist. Uh, I have also been fermenting homegrown cherry tomatoes and uh, habaneros. And I've shot video of that for a future bonus video as well. Uh, this past weekend, I made pasta sauce using four cups of that fermented cherry tomato stuff and a couple of spoonfuls of the habanero sauce because, man, the fermented habaneros came out way hot. Uh, delicious, but, you know, as they say, a little dab will do you. I uh, also added some homegrown basil and some rosemary in there. Man, it's it was way good with some spicy uh, spicy uh, uh, Italian sausage. I like cooking for the same reason that I love homebrewing, being creative and making delicious stuff from scratch. Another update from my hot porch hard seltzer that I made with A46 Bartleby from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. If you remember, last year my first batch of seltzer that I made stalled until I added more yeast nutrient. Uh, well, a similar thing happened this time. I pitched the Bartleby at around 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 C, and within a few hours there was airlock activity, and over the next couple of days I swirled the carboy to degas it, and tons of CO2 came out. But when I took a gravity reading, just like last year, it was still at or near the original gravity. So I put another dose of yeast nutrient in there, and so now we're we're at twice the recommended amount now. And a few days after that, uh, you know, I kept degassing it every day. Uh, a few days after I added that second dose of nutrient, the gravity readings showed it at 0.996. So Bartleby did do the job. It did it better than the uh, yeast I used last year because I didn't get down that far last year. Uh, and the seltzer this time tasted nice and clean with no residual sweetness at all, which is better than my results from last year. So when you're fermenting a mixture of just corn sugar and water, you really have to bump up that yeast nutrient and or energizer to get the job done. Uh, so I, I, f I racked the uh, the finished seltzer onto into the keg on top of a three-pound can's worth of uh, uh blackberry puree, and I just tasted some a, a couple minutes ago, and and, and it's really good. <laughs> it's, it's really good. Uh, A46 Bartleby is the Hornendahl Kvike strain. That's the summer seasonal yeast from Imperial Organic Yeast. I used it to ferment a 1070 Original Gravity New England IPA on my hot porch, as you might have seen in the video. 
and it just ripped through uh, with no starter in just a couple of days. Didn't have a problem at all, resulting in a delicious hoppy beer with tons of tropical fruit flavors. And I have another pouch of A46 Bartleby waiting in the wings, and I'm looking forward to using it before the heat of the summer goes away. With a pitch rate of 200 billion cells per easy-to-open pouch, my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches with Imperial Organic Yeast. Ask your local homebrew store about A46 Bartleby from Imperial Organic Yeast and visit them at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Okay, in the first interview a few weeks ago with Keith Via, we kind of scratched the surface on brewing with cannabis, and I, 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 I kind of got distracted a few times and <laughs> went down some bunny trails because Keith is the founder of Blue Moon and has some really interesting history to tell about the earlier days of craft beer. So this time we talk more in-depth about brewing with cannabis and making non-alcoholic beer at home. Dr. Keith Villa, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, James. Yeah, my pleasure to be back uh, talking to you and, and to your, uh, your uh, listeners. Yeah, just a great day today. Great day to talk about beer. Excellent. Well, I've, I, since we've talked, I've downloaded your book, uh, so I've got some questions on specifics about that. Uh, and it was a good read, and it's available. I got it on Amazon, uh, you know, electronically. So I got to download it immediately to my Kindle app, and so you know, you get immediate gratification nowadays with books. <laughs> <laughs> so, how's the response been so far? Well, first off, yeah, thank you for uh, giving it a read and uh, really uh, going through it. Uh, yeah, the response has been great. Uh, we've had people. Around around the world uh, requesting the book, uh, everywhere from South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, uh, because it's such a, an interesting topic and it's a, a relevant topic to today's times where uh, cannabis is becoming legalized in one form or another, uh, literally around the world. And so uh, response has been great and um, uh, not just from uh, uh, home brewers, but from craft brewers and just uh, uh, lay people on the street who, who really don't know a lot about brewing, but they love beer and they most likely love cannabis. And we talked last time, you are the founder, not only the founder of uh, uh, Blue Moon, uh, which is pretty cool, but you're also the founder of Seria Brewing, uh, which you have a line of non-alcoholic products and then you have a line of non-alcoholic uh beer with THC uh, added. Uh, so we're going to talk to a, a bit about in this podcast about home brewers, and you know we'll talk about uh, some some methods that they can use to reduce or or possibly remove the alcohol in their own brews. But we didn't talk about last time uh, consuming an alcoholic beverage that has uh, cannabis or THC in it. So. Are there some safety concerns that we should be thinking about, you know, when we're drinking responsibly? Uh, if someone is is experienced in drinking alcohol and experienced maybe uh, in using THC, uh, are there some things that they need to be thinking about when combining those two together uh, and consuming? Yeah, James, that's a great question. And yes, uh, I can't stress enough how important it is for people to uh, be cautious when approaching uh, an evening where you're going to have both cannabis and alcohol uh, in a single beverage or com combining the two uh, it, in the same event. It is um, potentially fraught with uh, negative outcomes for a number of reasons. But primarily, uh, the main thing we know is that we don't know a bunch about cannabis. Uh, all these different cannabinoids, there are over 100 of them in the plant. And we're most of us are familiar with CBD, which is kind of a soothing, uh, maybe a sleep enhancer, or pain reducer. Uh, and then a lot of us are familiar with THC, which is the compound that gets people high and intoxicated. But the 99 other uh, cannabinoids in the plant uh, really have not been studied thoroughly in regards to how they interact with 
alcohol, with prescription medications, uh, etc. So, so there's there's just a lot of unknowns. Um, and and one thing um, that I do tell people, and and it's in the book, is is um, that uh, people on chemotherapy usually take cannabis because uh, it it prevents uh, uh, the the throwing up and it's an anti-emetic which uh, really uh, gets that nauseous nauseous feeling uh, in our bodies to go away um, and so so it's very helpful helpful for people on, on chemo and and the way it works uh, according to science is is that cannabis uh, stimulates the vagus nerve in the very back of the throat that's that nerve when you when you put your finger down your throat and you gag uh, that gag reflex is all be- because of that nerve but if you're uh, taking cannabis you can try to make yourself throw up like that and, and it's hard to do because that nerve has been stimulated and it's not uh, very active mm. so uh, keep that in mind so now imagine you are at a party and so let, let's go back a few years say you're at a uh, college party frat party whatever uh and people are drinking uh, shots, maybe it's shots of tequila, um, and having cannabis. Now, with that nerve stimulated, that vagus nerve at the back of our throats, we can drink and drink and drink um, uh, until the bottle's empty. Now, without cannabis, you know, after after about five, six, seven, eight shots, uh, that's enough to kind of trigger the body into a mode where you say. Oh boy, <laughs> I've had too much alcohol. You run to the bathroom to throw up to get all that alcohol out of your system before it goes into the bloodstream and can wreak havoc on the body. Uh, because alcohol is a toxin and it can kill people when the blood alcohol level gets too high. Now with that nerve stimulated, you can literally literally drink the, the whole bottle of tequila and say, oh man, I still feel, you know, I'm feeling good. But it won't last very long because mm. uh, you will get very, very sick. If and it, if not sick, it could lead to uh, very tragic consequences. So that's just one example. Um, and then I, I always uh, point to the example of uh, uh, mixing alcohol with caffeine. When that trend came out back in the 90s, uh, some folks, some of your listeners may remember uh, Four loco and uh, these type of uh, beverages that came on the scene. And uh, the main reason was that people wanted to stay up all night partying and they didn't want to get tired and go to sleep. And so they thought, well, you know, if you combine Red Bull with vodka or uh, uh, alcohol with caffeine, then you can stay up and have a great time and party all night. What they didn't realize was that having an, an upper and a downer in the same beverage um, could lead to some some very bad health consequences. And that's exactly what happened. Um, reports of everything from uh, heart arrhythmias to uh, uh, date rapes mm. to just all kinds of negative uh, consequences uh, were reported and it led to the FDA issuing a um, letter that said get these things off the shelves because they are posing a, a public uh, problem and um, uh, it needs to be studied much more in depth so so yeah so that happened uh, uh, during the 90s and uh, and again it was because people just didn't realize uh, the consequences of mixing to known uh, entities together. People thought they knew everything about caffeine because most people drink coffee in the morning and most people thought they knew everything about alcohol because quite a few people have had uh, uh, an alcoholic beverage and they thought, well, you know, it must be okay to mix the two, but turns out that it's not. And so that's, that's uh, example number two, but uh, you can go on and on and just uh, really list these things that um, can potentially lead to um, tragic consequences. So that's why anybody, any home brewer wanting to experiment uh, with cannabis and uh, home brew, uh, I always advise them to, to use a lot of caution. And if you can, uh, try to start out uh, making non-alcoholic home brews first, uh, put the cannabis in, uh, see how it works, and and just just take it step by step. Use baby steps because, mm. uh, and and definitely don't be ashamed uh, of that because there are unknowns. And uh, for those who have experience with both alcohol and cannabis, uh, when you mix them, 
the reaction is called cross fading and that's when you, you get buzzed and high at the same time and in excess it, it can lead to couch lock where you're just laying on a couch for hours hoping that feeling goes away mm. um, uh, and at, at very minor uh, levels uh, people who do it report that it's very pleasurable but uh, again those are people with a lot of experience and I certainly don't recommend that uh, to any of your listeners. I, I rec recommend they always start uh, with baby steps when it comes to cannabis. And I said last time that I'm a <clears throat> I'm a THC lightweight, uh, so you know the way it affects me, I'm sure, is not the same as uh, as someone with a lot of experience. Uh, and I've discovered uh, in in uh, using some uh, some legally acquired uh, edible products. Uh, that the timing is much different from alcohol. And, you know, combining those two, uh, you know, may be a tricky thing as well. So, you know, the, if you, uh, how you consume alcohol and, and how it affects your body and how you consume as opposed to smoking uh, THC, uh, they're, they're different, right? Right. You're absolutely right. With edibles, um, the technology for edibles uh, and cannabis uh, is such that it, it will generally take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours for that uh, for the cannabinoids to get into your system and actually uh, make you feel uh, the the high the THC high and um, and it is a little more intense because as it, as it uh, as the THC goes through your your digestive tract, it eventually gets changed by the liver from delta nine THC, which is the one we're all familiar with, to delta eleven, which is uh, a more potent form, and that's why edibles can can really be. Um, uh, well, fraught with with some problems because they they uh, take longer to uh, have an effect and. Uh, the effect can be more intense. Um, and it's, it's kind of a tricky situation because when most people don't feel anything after, say, 20 minutes, uh, a lot of people get uh, um, antsy and they say, well, I'm going to take another one because, <laughs> you know, it, 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 what could it hurt? But <laughs> and that happens. We've seen it happen uh, here in Colorado um, when it was first legalized. Uh, I've got friends uh, over at the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, which which is one of those big party schools, and um, they said that uh, pretty much every every start of uh, school, when parents bring their kids to the university to say goodbye, they'll have edibles, and of course the, the the mom and the dad will try to enjoy some with the kid, and you know have a last. Uh, party if you will before heading back home and they don't feel the effects so they have another one and another and another and pretty soon they um you know they're they're in a bad condition and uh, uh they typically will call 911 mm. and and then the ambulance shows up and uh the the person is just kind of overdosed on THC and so uh, what they do is is they you know they just say you've got to just rest and, and sleep this off um but Nine out of ten times, the poor parents think they're having a heart attack, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just uh, yeah. So so yeah, it's it's uh, just lots of uh, cases like that, uh, not just in Colorado but around the country as it becomes legal. So let's talk about uh, taking the alcohol out of our of our beer, uh, you know, to kind of remove one variable of, of that equation. Uh, and professional brewers have. Uh, a lot of mechanical advantages over home brewers, right? Right. Uh, professional brewers, uh, those, those who have the funds uh, can purchase uh, pieces of equipment such as vacuum distillation units or reverse osmosis units, membranes, uh, to remove the alcohol. Um, and uh, those uh, craft brewers who, who don't have the financial means to do that uh, certainly have the means to do an arrested fermentation. Uh, by arrested fermentation, it, it's exactly what it says. Uh, you stop the, the fermentation prematurely before the alcohol level gets above the 0.5% uh, level and, uh, and becomes what's known as, as beer or alcoholic beer. 
Uh, so, so a lot of brands in the marketplace right now are actually arrested fermentation brands. And you can taste them because they have a, a little bit of residual wort sweetness to them. Whereas the uh, fully fermented brews that have alcohol removed taste more along the lines of, of a beer. Mm. Uh, they, don't, they don't have that uh, sweetness, that malt, malty, wordy sweetness to them. And there, there are methods, uh, uh, you know, expensive methods that, uh, you know, commercial breweries uh, uh, use to, to take the alcohol out. And, and I don't know if you want to get into the details. I don't know if there's some proprietary stuff with Saria. Uh, do you want to talk about how you get the alcohol out of, uh, out of your beer? Sure, I can. I, I won't go into detail because it is proprietary, but uh, we use two methods. One is vacuum distillation along with um, uh, proprietary uh, uh, brewing uh, methods. That's that's one way we do it uh, because we, we want our beer to really look, smell, and taste like beer. So our, our beers, if you pour them out into a glass, they have a, a nice uh, thick head on them. They look like beer, smell like beer, taste like beer, but they're 0.0% alcohol because they're fully fermented and um, uh, have all the alcohol removed down to 0.0. Um, and then we have a second proprietary method we use uh, also that's a um, it's a combination brewing and fermenting method that uh, allows us to get to 0, 0.0 um, without vacuum distillation. So we use both methods. But the second method uh, uh, is patented, or we, we uh, applied for a patent, so it's patent pending. And um, uh, we feel that both methods produce really good flavored beer for, for our purposes and, and for our, our customers. And you recently announced that you're, you're going into uh, California now. Yes, we will. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we went into the California market with our cannabis beer, uh, because for the first uh, three years, we were in Colorado only, and it gave us a lot of uh, valuable information on how to, uh, how to make it, how to market it, sell it, uh, package it, uh, you know, everything uh, that we needed to, to know. We learned uh, really on the streets here in Colorado. And then, um, uh, like I said, we finally got into the California market two weeks ago. And uh, for your listeners uh, who may not know, California is the biggest cannabis market in the world. Uh, Canada has uh, legalized cannabis federally, but uh, it's, it's not the biggest mar cannabis market in the world. It is the biggest uh, legal market uh, at this point, actually, no, I think California might even be bigger than Canada right now. But uh, wow. and and uh, California is is growing, um, uh, and and as I said, it is the biggest market. Although it does have quite a bit of black market activity, uh, the officials over there are trying to reduce that uh, and really get people to to abide by the rules and uh, uh, s sell it, grow it, uh, purchase it legally, not through the black market channels. So for us home brewers, uh, how do we get, if we don't have, uh, you know, vacuum distillers, <laughs> I'm assuming <laughs> most home brewers don't. Uh, I haven't seen a Blickman uh, vacuum distiller out there, but uh, how do we get the alcohol out of our beer, say if we want to do you know a standard fermentation or a standard beer and get the alcohol out, what what are are our options? So as, as home brewers, um, the 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 easiest and best way uh, is to heat the home brew up. So in the book, I, I go over steps on how to do this. So uh, a lot of us know that the boiling point of alcohol is approximately 173 degrees Fahrenheit. And so uh, what we do is we uh, heat the, the, after we've uh, brewed, fermented and aged the beer, uh, we rack it off the aging tank, put it into the uh, back into the uh, brew kettle or the, the home brew pot and uh, heat it up to 173 degrees um, and hold it there uh, for, for about one hour. And um, 
the easy way to to uh, really gauge everything is to use your senses. So as it heats up to 173 degrees, and, and once you achieve that temperature, you, you'll smell the kind of a sweet solventy smell coming off the beer, and that's the alcohol that's being removed. And um, uh, after 30 minutes, uh, you'll have approximately, I, I would say, uh, the, the the majority of alcohol will be gone, and and you could smell that that sweet solventy smell has has diminished, uh, and then keep holding it for another thirty minutes, and at that point you should be very close to 0.5 percent ABV, which is considered a non-alcoholic beer, and um, uh, and I've I've tested tested uh, that procedure uh, with an alcohol analyzer, and, mm. and sure enough, uh, at least up here in the altitude of uh, Colorado, being a mile high, uh, holding it at 173 degrees for one hour uh, does get my bruised a five uh, roughly five. 0.5% ABV beer uh, goes all the way down to 0.5% after one hour at 173 degrees. Ah. So, uh, so it works. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the couple of things you have to be aware of are uh, number one, uh, heating at that temperature will convert more alpha acids into bitterness. That is the isomerized alpha acids. So, so if you're going to make a non-alcoholic beer, just be aware of that so that you can, um, uh, just adjust your recipe and decrease the hops accordingly because you'll probably end up with about five to 10 more IBUs of bitterness. And so, uh, uh, so just be aware of that. And then the other thing is, is uh, you, you could end up with some um, oh, lightly uh, cooked flavors in the beer. Um, and, and so darker beers like porters and stouts uh, amber ales uh, any of these darker uh, styles are uh, a little more amenable to um, boiling off the alcohol uh, lighter beers you, you can still do it with lighter beers but um, but uh, you'll just have to experiment and see but uh, yeah in my experience uh, the darker beers usually turn out a little bit better uh, when you're making home-brewed non-alcoholic beers with that method and uh, uh, the other way to make non-alcoholic brews at home is to use uh, yeasts that don't ferment glucose. And so the, with those, uh, what you do is you uh, uh, get your homebrew recipe together. And um, what you do is, is get, uh, you target a, a lower specific gravity, um, original gravity, because uh, you don't want to uh, target a high gravity that, that will end up with you know, five, six, seven percent alcohol. Uh, you want to target so, somewhere around uh, 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 two, three, four degrees uh, OG. You use these yeasts uh, which don't ferment glucose. And so, what you have to do is is do a hot mash. Typically, you know, seventy-two to seventy-five degrees uh, Celsius centigrade, and um, and really try to avoid making any glucose f for these strains. And um, with the maltose present, they'll uh, they won't ferment that. They'll just leave it untouched. And um, and by targeting that lower gravity, you won't have such a sweet final taste in the beer. Hmm. So uh, so yeah, so a couple of methods that uh, your listeners could try to make their own non-alcoholic beer, uh, which in, in in these times. Uh, you know, alcohol is, is one of those things we always want to be uh, using responsibly. Uh, and, and, you know, if you want to pace yourself with your own homemade brew, that's one way to do it is use, you know, make your own uh, N.A. brews and pace yourself. Or, or if you have guests, uh, friends that don't drink, because uh, so many more people nowadays are, are becoming uh, sober curious. They want to know what it's like to go on a weekend without alcohol, um, <laughs> then uh, uh, by all means, uh, brew up a non-alcoholic beer for, for these folks and uh, have fun uh, and, you know, party party sober. <laughs> now, I, we've had a, a guest, a home brewer guest in the past uh, who attempted to make a non-alcoholic beer using the, the heating technique. Uh, and, you know, depending on the sophistication of your home system, uh, and your ability to to maintain temperatures and things like that, uh, you may have varying levels of success. Uh, you know, I I in my 
not entirely unscientific, but I had a, a breathalyzer. Uh, and so I tested it first with O'Doul's. Uh, you know, I get, took one for the team there, but I, t- I tested one with O'Doul's and, and uh, uh, you know, the breathalyzer after 15 minutes uh, it said that I had a zero uh, blood alcohol level. And then I tested the homebrew in the, in the same way, and it did detect some alcohol. So, um you know, there, so that is a caveat. You know, if you're if you're doing this at home, uh, that you might want to do some you know some testing on your own to to make sure that your techniques are are working properly, making sure that your equipment is is uh, able to maintain the temperatures and and things like that. Uh, but you know, like like a lot of things in home brewing, it's 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 not an exact science. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of art. Uh, that's involved. And so, yeah, that's where, uh, yeah, with with the um, alcohol distillation method, when you're heating, you, you do have to be very careful that it, it stays at 173 degrees um, for for a full hour. If, if uh, you know, if it drops below that, uh, there's going to be more alcohol in the brew. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so definitely use, use as, as many scientific instruments as as you have at home uh and use your senses too and and yeah if you, if you have access to a breathalyzer uh definitely uh test it out that way too but um but once you get fairly proficient at it um then then it'll become um as easy as making your 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 standard go-to recipe whatever that is there's yet another delicious offering available from our friends and sponsors Ricky and Kelly at Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies up in Vermont. Ricky says Rose Brew is back and shipping across the country right now. Rose Brew is a tasty craft mead made from honey, of course, rose hips, and rose water. And it's 6.5% ABV like many of the Gronfell and Havoc honey-based beverages. It's very sessionable and perfect for summertime quaffing. Theodore M. on Untapped says Rose Brew is rosy sweet, just a tad tart, and del- a delicious craft mead. John P. on uh, Untapped says Rose Brew has a tasty and fruity bouquet. Delicious! Gronfeld delivers to most states across the country. If you order from Gronfeld.com, you can find a wide selection of delicious craft, honey-based beverages, and find fun mead-related accessories, too. Check them out at family-owned and operated Gronfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Now let's talk about uh, the other side of the equation, the the, the cannabis part. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a cannabis newbie. I'm a, ca- a cannabis lightweight. Uh, so what parts of the, if you're growing your own, where it's, and it's legal in some states nowadays, if you're growing your own, what what are the parts of the plant that we're after that we can use in our brew? You can't just use everything, right? Um, kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, so it's it's interesting with cannabis because I think a lot of a lot of your listeners have probably probably experimented uh, growing their own hops, which which are totally legal. Um, and hops uh, are fun to grow and, and harvest the cones and, and make your own home brew. Um, and and uh, they, they're kind of like weeds; they they can get out of control if you mm-hmm. don't uh, really maintain them. Uh, cannabis plants are are cousins uh, of the hop plant, and um, they they grow annually, uh, die off and seed every year. Versus a, a hop, which has the rhizomes and uh, the crown, uh, and can grow year after year um, from the same planting, but uh, Cannabis, uh, as, as you grow it, and I should say that, uh, you know, only, only do it where it's legal, obviously. Here in Colorado, uh, it's legal for one person to grow up to six plants at home, and six cannabis plants will, will give you enough cannabis to last a long, long time. It's, uh, a, the plant can uh, produce quite a bit of uh, material. So what we're looking for are the buds uh, of the cannabis plant, which are similar to hop cones, the buds have all of the uh, essential material, the cannabinoids and the terpenes uh, in them, similar to the hop cones. Uh, when, you, when you look at a hop cone, uh, you'll lift up the, the, the leaves, the, the bracteoles and everything, and, and see inside that 
uh, there are yellow uh, little pockets of, of resin. Uh, these are called the lupulin glands, and that's where all the, the magic is uh, stored in the hops. So you, you have all the, the alpha acids, you have lots of terpenes, uh, and it's an oily compound because you, you can put your fingers in, in that yellow powder and uh, rub them together, and you'll see it's, it's very oily and thick. Um, in this, a very similar way, the buds from cannabis uh, plants um, have glands, uh, they're called trichomes. Uh, and the trichomes uh, contain all of the, the magic uh, that's in, in cannabis. So the trichomes have the terpenes and the cannabinoids uh, all inside those glands. And so that's what you're after primarily uh, are the buds, uh, because that's, uh, you'll find lots of material there to to smoke, brew, uh, cook with. Um, and, and in a very similar way, uh, you have to heat the hop materials in your brew to make them active. So the alpha acids um, aren't bitter until you heat them up and turn them into isomerized or, or iso alpha acids. And that's when they become bitter and, and make beer taste really good. Uh, and in the same way, uh, the cannabis uh, cannabinoids have to be heated to become activated. So you can eat the buds all day long and eat part of the plants, uh, but you're not going to get high uh, because those cannabinoids have not been activated. You have to heat them. And that's what smoking does. That's what uh, cooking with them does. And, and when you heat them, the cannabinoids, um, uh, what they do is, is they have a, a, uh, an acid attachment to them. And that acid attachment detaches with heat. And when it detaches, then CBD, THC become fully active and um, will do their job, uh, you know, whether it's you wanting to get high or you wanting some, some sleep or, or pain reduction through CBD and the other um, cannabinoids, uh, they'll become fully active to do their job. And what are the magic temperature ranges that we're, that we're looking at? Uh, again, very similar to hops. Um, st starting at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that's when you start seeing the, uh, it's called decarbox decarboxylation of these acids because it, they're, it's, the technical name is carboxylic acids that are on these uh, cannabinoids. And, and so they be, start becoming decarboxylated at around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, similar to uh, uh, the hop compounds. Uh, you know, when you boil them uh, at 212 degrees, that's when, uh, that's when all the magic starts happening. So, so yeah, uh, it's approximately 200 degrees. You hold uh, the buds at that temperature and they will become, fully activated. And in the book, I talk about how to fully activate everything. But uh, in general, that's how you do it. And, um, and then they're ready for brewing or uh, whatever you want to do with them. <laughs> so uh, uh, and, and like I said, uh, take it carefully, because once these things are activated, uh, they, they will get into the body. Uh, if you eat them or uh, smoke it or, or what have you, they will get in and they will uh, be very active. So uh, again, take it with, uh, with caution and, um, and, and, you know, try to keep records too, because a lot of homebrewers, I think, will uh, readily admit that they're innovators. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of your guests and, and a lot of your listeners have come up with brews that they're very proud of that are really, really unique. And in the same vein, uh, if and when they start experimenting with with cannabis, they'll probably make some cool discoveries. So take lots of notes uh, so that we can advance, uh, you know, the, the cause of homebrewing and homebrewing with cannabis uh, so that uh, all of us learn more from each other. And, and that was one reason for writing the book was to give people kind of a, a starting point so that they can uh, really uh, uh, start to experiment and, and see what's happening. But also to to help each other out so that if they find some cool thing uh, happening with cannabis and in a homebrew um, by all means uh, uh, report out on it and uh, whether it's a letter to Zymergy or uh, on your on your uh, uh, homebrew forum uh, just please uh, let the world know if you find out anything cool about the plant uh, but uh, talking about that you've got a bunch of recipes in this book 
Uh, and some of them are from the early uh, uh, pioneers in, in brewing with, uh, with THC, brewing with cannabis. And in their recipes, they don't specifically talk about decarboxylation. So uh, w talk about that. In, it, in their recipes, the way they used cannabis, were they not fully utilizing uh, the product? In my experience, oh, yeah, in, let me clarify for your guests. Yes, uh, in the book, I have uh, modern recipes. Uh, I've got some from myself um, uh, and some from uh, modern home brewers. And then I have several from a book. Uh, it was the first cannabis brewing book published uh, back in 1996, uh, back when it truly was illegal. Um, and the gentleman who published it was uh, named Ed Rosenthal. Actually, I shouldn't say was. He's still alive. Uh, he's considered kind of the godfather of cannabis because he's so active in everything cannabis. But he decided to write a book on brewing with cannabis back in 1996. And it was the first book. Um, and, and back then, of course, brewing methodologies were uh, more primitive than they are today. Um, brewing with with all grain uh, was almost unheard of for a home brewer. Um, and so um, so the recipes that are in this book uh, are all extract based. And yes, they, they put cannabis in. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that back then they, they didn't know a whole lot uh, compared to what we know today about activating cannabis and the temperatures that have to be achieved. So, so they probably got a little bit of activity. Um, uh, that is, uh, I would say the, the, the activity in, in making people high and uh, uh, getting the uh, THC to be active, but, but certainly not as, as much as you can today. And, and the reason I put those recipes in was uh, for historic uh, facts so that readers can see uh, what, what people were doing uh, in the very first attempts at making cannabis beer uh, compared to what you can do today. And, and also uh, for those people that want to try to recreate some of those historic recipes, uh, I put that in there for, for those folks so that they can um, you know, have their hand at uh, making an extract brew the way the very first ones were done in the 90s and here uh, you know i'm talking about the 90s that, that wasn't that long ago <laughs> that wasn't, it wasn't like the 1800s or something like that sometimes you know? it feels like it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, but yeah it's um, uh, again my guess is is they they didn't fully activate the cannabis but they there was probably enough there to get them high and um, and again they didn't uh de-alcoholize the beer so so uh the beers typically would have had, uh, you know, 4%, 5% ABV and uh, uh, combined with a tiny bit of cannabis and, um, and, and I'm sure probably had a, a, an effect on them. Uh, and, and yeah, they, they probably had some fun with it, but I think they, uh, they probably realized that they could get, get high much better by smoking it. And so, <laughs> so that book was published and nothing really was published after that until uh, my book this year. And, and in the book, I, I, I go into some detail about the, the science of, of decarboxylation and how to do it and make sure you get most of the uh, THC activated so that you can have the full effect in the beer. And uh, uh, I didn't mean to say that all the, all the recipes were were ancient, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you do go in and and annotate uh, these these recipes uh, from the past, uh, you know, kind of bring bringing them up to date or, or you know suggesting ways that they can be brought up to date and kind of commenting on what what the beers probably were like back then, uh, but back then. Uh, it, the cannabis was just like hops today. Uh, you know, the hops today are, are a lot more powerful as far as the alpha acid content. I'm assuming that similar things are, or a similar thing is happening with cannabis, you know, especially with commercial breeders and commercial growers. The cannabis of today is probably a different animal than the, than the cannabis of even in the 90s. Oh, oh James, you are 100 percent correct. Uh, in the 90s and, and before uh, cannabis was 
not as potent as it is today. Uh, back then, you're talking about THC levels of, you know, three, four, five, even 6% uh, THC. And that was uh, considered really good stuff back then. Um, similar to hops, uh, you know, years ago, um, alpha acid contents in the nine or 10% level were, were high quality uh, hops for the big brewers. Uh, and nowadays you can find easily find hops in the you know 14 15 percent alpha range uh, and you can find really fantastic aromatic hops too like citra simcoe etc uh, and with cannabis uh, back then like i said three four five even six percent uh, were common today breeders have have really pushed the boundaries and so you you'll find some varieties uh, that are up to 30 31 percent thc wow uh, and those are powerful. So, so that's why, again, I, I um, you know, I urge your listeners, if they're going to experiment with it, uh, take it easy. Uh, it's almost like alcohol. If you were trying alcohol for the first time, you don't go out and start chugging shots of, of tequila. Mm-hmm. You uh, uh, most likely likely will have beer because it's the, the beverage of moderation and uh, kind of get used to it and, and see how much it takes, you know, for you to feel it. Uh, same thing with cannabis. Uh, take baby steps. Um, try to uh, determine uh, how much THC your body can handle. Because uh, as you alluded to earlier, some of us are more sensitive to it, uh, and while others are, are not as sensitive. So there, there are some people who uh, can have 100 milligrams and um, you know have barely a reaction, uh, whereas other people can have just a couple milligrams and be high as a kite. And so uh, uh, <laughs> most me. people are in the middle. <laughs> 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 yeah, most people are in the middle, but, uh, but yeah, but just be aware of, of those uh, cautionary tales and, and just take baby steps with cannabis. And you 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 uh, give methods and advice on on how to calculate the amount of THC you know in your in your beers depending on the the methodology uh, that you that you use. That's those are all in the in the details of the book. Our friends and sponsors at High Gravity in Tulsa are going to be hosting the Tulsa Craft Beer Invitational on Saturday, September 11th. I'm planning to be there. 30-plus Oklahoma breweries will be represented, around half the breweries in the state, and they're going to be serving special one-off beers brewed for the event. It's going to be outside, and attendance is limited, so you can feel safer in these COVID times. And while you're there, you can visit High Gravity and see the incredible inventory of homebrewing, and winemaking ingredients and equipment that they have on hand, including Warthog electric brewing gear. And you can order your Warthog gear on highgravitybrew.com using the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your Warthog purchase. And then, you know, if you talk to Dave and arrange it ahead of time, maybe you can pick up your shiny new system there at the at the thing. Make sure that you talk to Dave and... and he may be mad at me for saying this. I don't know. <laughs> That's Saturday, September 11th, in the parking lot of High Gravity in Tulsa. And check them out at family-owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. That's highgravitybrew.com. Um, I got uh, a question from a listener. Uh, I told listeners that uh, you'd be on the show. And he Wes on tw- on Twitter says, "Do you think that we'll start seeing defined brewing cannabis varieties like we have with hops, uh, in the sense that from year to year, Cascade is Cascade and Centennial is Centennial, or is cannabis more monolithic in use? So, do you see as you know the popularity of of you know brewing applications? Do you foresee some uh, hop varieties or or cannabis varieties as rising above others?" Um, I do and I don't. Um, <laughs> I do only for that very small part of the population that likes the smell and taste of cannabis. Uh, for your listeners that, that may not be familiar with the smell and taste of cannabis, um, most people describe it as the smell of burning rubber, a skunk, um, what else? There's these, um, and it's very similar to the light struck aroma in beer. Hmm. So if you, if you have your your homebrew, uh, take a glass of it, stick it out in the sun for five minutes, then smell it, and you'll smell that 
sunstruck reaction. And um, uh, that's, that's the, it's very similar to the smell of cannabis. And because of that, uh, it's, it's termed as, as polarizing, meaning that people either love it or they hate it. There's not a lot in the middle that say, oh, yeah, that's okay. They either love it or they hate it. And with that polarization of cannabis flavor, the majority of people don't like it. I, I would say, just my wild guess, is probably 80%, mm. 85% of, of people don't enjoy that smell of cannabis uh, because of that that uh, uh, skunky, uh, uh, light-struck aroma that's in it. And um, and that's that's just part of the, the cannabis uh, um, uh, smell and taste. You do have different varieties that have uh, different flavor aspects. Um, uh, Girl Scout cookies. I mean, there's just so many uh, different varieties like hops. And when you smoke it, you can detect the uh, the differences. Um, when you brew with it, uh, I would say I would say with the amount that you need, uh, it it will be very expensive to to use and uh it will be very polarizing in the fact that some people will say this this beer is really light struck mm. uh, and others will say man that smells like like pot and that's terrible <laughs> but you'll have this very small percent of people saying oh my gosh i can't get enough of that that is so awesome and uh, and so because of that uh i think you're not going to see it to the extent that you do with hops. Um, and, and, um, but, and, and that's why in the book, I don't really go into a lot of the uh, varieties of hops because of that polarization. What I do is I talk about uh, how to use the, the cannabinoids uh, because that's, that's really uh, a really nice piece of, of uh, science on, on how to utilize that plant is take those cannabinoids that don't have, an aroma to them. They do have a little bit of a bitterness to them and just use them in a, in a great tasting homebrew so that you have the taste, uh, the awesome taste of homebrew with the effects of the cannabis. And, and I've found that that seems to be the best way to go uh, for the majority of, of uh, brewers as well as uh, people who enjoy beer. And you do have a recipe for a skunk proof beer in here <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh, a lot of uh, uh, your listeners are probably really familiar with the fact that uh, you get a, uh, a light struck skunky aroma in beer and um, if it's exposed to the sun or light and uh, my daughter and i did some testing and found that you can actually prevent that and reverse that that uh, sensory aspect by using uh, um a little bit of copper and in the book i talk about that but uh, uh, when you put that in the brew uh, you can actually make home brews that you can take out in the sun and drink enjoy them uh, by the pool or uh, at the beach and uh, you, your beer won't go skunky so so it's uh, and um, I, I still have to do some experimentation to see if that will remove the skunkiness of cannabis because mm. um, i ran across an article uh in in the cannabis <laughs> there's a lot of cannabis uh, articles being published nowadays but uh about a month ago a researcher said that the uh, the same compound that causes that skunkiness in cannabis uh is very similar uh to mbt which is the compound that causes the light struck react the smell in beer so if it is that same sulfur compound then it should be possible to clean it up with uh copper and then you and then at that point you would be able to have varietals of cannabis that you can brew with or you can uh make beverages with and, and really have have fun with uh, uh, all the different uh, uh, cool varieties that are out there so we're just getting started we're just scratching the surface of this whole thing and we and we just and we just scratch the surface of of uh, what's in the book. You talk about a lot about the history. You talk about uh, the legal ram ramifications. You know, you give advice on on branding for uh, commercial breweries. Uh, the you know, it's a <clears throat> it's a, it's a really uh, interesting read and in, from you know beyond just the uh, techniques of of home brewing. Uh, but uh, you know, I urge people if they're if they're interested at all in the topic to pick up brewing with cannabis by dr keith via and and keith 
you've you've uh, you've spent another hour with me, and I, I appreciate it. <laughs> Gosh, James, you've got to stop meeting like this. <laughs> well, thank you. It's it's been fun, and and I I, I do honestly and sincerely sincerely hope that. Um, your readers will learn something from the book because uh, uh, it really is a, um, it kind of gives a lot of information from uh, the marketing and sales aspect, the legalities, the, how to grow your plant, how, how to work with this thing. Because my, my hope is that uh, at least one of your listeners uh, will start a, a business. Uh, and by the time it becomes federally legal, if, if one of your listeners happens to have a, uh, a small cannabis business with some really cool tasting products, my guess is when it's federally legal, you will see uh, pharmaceutical companies, big breweries, uh, big soft drink companies go in and, and scoop up uh, any cool business idea. Uh, and, and, you know, for these big companies, it, it could be as simple as them writing you a you know, $5 million check or a $25 million check for your, your business. And, uh, and then they will get that idea and just blow it up into a hugely popular format for, for the public. And, um, but, but in the meantime, you know, one of your listeners uh, could be lucky enough to, to have this business and, and end up with a, a nice check. And, um, and, and I, I've told a lot of my friends, you know, this is, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity because, once federal legalization happens, uh, after that, uh, it's going to—it's the, the chance to to really uh, get in there and you know make money or, or uh, have some fun with it. You can always have fun with it, but who knows? Your, one of your listeners may end up starting something and send you a postcard from their, their own private island. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, excellent. It, it sounds exciting, and, uh, and uh, I look forward to, to kind of tracking the developments. But, uh, again, I, I appreciate the, the book, and I appreciate the time, Keith. Well, James, yeah, it's been fun again. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to talk again. And, and if ever you, you find your way out here for uh, Great American Beer Festival or anything, please uh, stop by. We'll taste beers, uh, even taste a cannabis beer, and uh, have some fun. Sounds great. Well, thanks again to Keith. I don't know that I'll ever be brewing with THC, but you never know. I I know friends who say they get health benefits from CBD, so who knows what the future holds. And I'm interested again in the process of making non-alcoholic beer myself, so there may be some experiments down the line on that. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies always coming your way. Check those out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. <laughs>